Hi, everybody. Happy Earth Day. My name is Alex. I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. And today I'm joined by Gus, the Barred Owl. So today, if you've taken a look at our schedule, which is down below, if you're watching on wildlifecenter.org, you can scroll past the moderated discussion and see our entire list of events and descriptions of each of those for, for today and for the rest of the day. If you've taken a peek at that and looked at head, then you know that today I'll be talking all about barred owls and Gus in particular. But before we dive in to owls, first I wanna say thank you to everybody who has been hanging out with us and celebrating Earth Day 2020 online. I know this year is a little bit different in the way that we're celebrating, but it's a celebration all the same. And we are so thankful that not only have you guys been hanging out with us, but we've actually seen some donations come into the Wildlife Center in honor of Earth Day specifically. And we are so, so grateful for that because as a working wildlife hospital, we don't have holidays off. The veterinarians and rehabilitators are working behind the scenes right now to take care of animals like owls and lots of other species, and those donations make a huge difference. So back to Gus. Today, I'll be teaching you guys a little bit about who she is, where she came from, why she ended up at the Wildlife Center, and why she's sitting on my glove instead of living a wild life. So I think it's important, first of all, to maybe take a step back and look at the big picture and think about who our education ambassadors are. These are animals that were at one time wild. They were born in the wild. They spent some portion of their lives as wild animals, but they've come into the Wildlife Center first as patients. And for different reasons throughout all of our oh, few dozen education ambassadors, they've been deemed non-releasable. Sometimes that's because of a physical injury. Sometimes that's because of a chronic illness or condition. Other times it's a behavioral issue. So for all these different species, owls, hawks, falcons, turtles, and snakes, the reason that they live with us at the Wildlife Center is because they can't survive on their own in the wild. And also they have a story or a background that's a good chance for us to share with the world, to teach them about wildlife and about the environment. Because that's our goal, that's our overall mission as an organization. The Wildlife Center of Virginia is a nonprofit teaching and research hospital with a mission of teaching the world to care about and to care for wildlife and the environment. And what a perfect chance Earth Day is for us to share this information and knowledge. So back to Gus, the real star of the show. She's a barred owl and that's spelled B-A-R-R-E-D. They get their names from those brown stripes that go up and down on their stomachs. So Gus is a little bit different compared to most of our other education animals. Because if you recall, our education animals are non-releasable, usually because of a physical injury. Perhaps they're missing an eye. Perhaps they broke a bone that didn't heal the right way. Well, Gus is in really good shape. She's actually quite healthy. She is an adult female barred owl. And we know that she's non-releasable because of her behavior. She was sadly kidnapped from her nest when she was very, very young, still dependent on her mother and father for protection, for feeding, everything else. She was stolen from her wild parents by somebody who thought she would make a good pet. It's a pretty sad story, if you ask me. And I know a lot of you out there probably feel the same way. We know that someone knew that Gus had been kidnapped illegally. It's against the law to keep any wild bird in your home without a permit. And that's in part due to the Migratory uh, Bird Protection Act. So we know that somebody was aware that Gus had been kidnapped. That person called the authorities who then confiscated Gus and brought her right to the Wildlife Center of Virginia. Unfortunately, at that time, the damage had already been done to Gus's behavior. When birds are very young, they'll go through a developmental process called imprinting. And that's when a bird will look to whatever's taking care of it. It should be their wild bird parents. And they will essentially copy those parents' behaviors. It's a permanent and non-reversible process. So in the wild, Gus would have looked at her wild owl parents. She would have copied their behaviors, things like how to communicate, 
with other barred owls. She would have learned what animals are a threat, what animals are food. She would have learned all the hunting techniques that she would have needed to survive, sadly, because she was in human captivity during that imprinting phase, because she was stolen and she was being held by people. She thinks that she belongs with humans. I don't think that Gus believes she's a human being. I don't think that, but it's true that she thinks she belongs with us. So we know that even though Gus is physically in really good shape, we know that she doesn't have the mental or behavioral skills to survive as a barred owl on her own in the wild. Something I think is really great about Gus is that she is one of our oldest education ambassadors here at the center. And we know, unlike some of our other education ambassadors, exactly how old she is. So we know that Gus hatched in the spring of 1994. You heard me correctly, 1994. That means that this spring, Gus officially turned 26 years old. That's, I'm guessing, probably older than some of the people watching this stream right now. That sounds really impressive, like a very long lifespan. And it certainly is for a barred owl. But it's important to remember that here at the Wildlife Center, Gus has a really, really good life. She has the best veterinary care that any wild animal could get. Just like your pets at home, they go to veterinarians for appointments, to get medications or checkups. Those things happen here at the Wildlife Center for our education animals. She gets food delivered right to her outdoor enclosure six days a week. We have perfectly nutritionally balanced meals for her every single time. So it's not crazy. It's not out of the ordinary for a barred owl that's been kept in captivity and cared for well to reach an age of 26 years old like Gus. Now in the wild, usually, the bigger the animal, the longer the lifespan. And the most significant reason for that is because small animals are food for bigger animals. Now there certainly are larger owls than Gus out there. Here in Virginia, that's where the Wildlife Center is. The only owl species that's larger in size and body mass would be the great horned owl, but not by much. Gus is a fully grown adult female. Usually female raptors are a little bit bigger than their male counterparts. So in the wild, you might expect a barred owl to have a lifespan of anywhere from 10 to maybe 15 years. But again, it's not crazy to think that our captive raptors here at the center could live to be twice that age. There are some things in particular that make owls really, really cool and unique compared to other raptors. I'll say that word a bunch more times today. A raptor is a bird of prey that uses their feet and their sharp talons to grasp their food. And raptor actually comes from a Latin word, repare, which translates loosely into um, grasping or seizing or carrying off or taking. So a raptor is a bird of prey that uses those sharp talons and strong gripping feet to catch their prey. Owls are very, very well adapted to their lifestyle and they're excellent hunters. And there are three main adaptations, physical adaptations that set them apart from other birds. And that would be their eyes, their ears, and their feathers. So let's start with their eyes. Most owl species that people are familiar with, most owl species here in Virginia are nocturnal. That means that they are the most active at nighttime, after the sun goes down, before the sun comes up, the opposite of a nocturnal animal is called a diurnal animal. So diurnal birds of prey, those that are the most active during the daytime, include species like hawks and eagles and falcons. Owls, as nocturnal animals, must have very specialized adaptations to be successful hunters at nighttime. And one of the most obvious features, very characteristic for an owl, are those huge eyes. And we'll see if Gus tolerates being a little closer to the camera for this part. So you can see those big, beautiful brown eyes. That is a wonderful adaptation that owls have as nocturnal hunters. And her eyes are gigantic. 
compared to the rest of her body, even her face. If we had eyes that were the same size as an owl's proportionately, they would look like grapefruits or tennis balls sticking halfway out of our heads. And that's what it actually looks like underneath all those feathers on her face in owl's eyes actually protrude from their eye sockets. And for that reason, when owls are admitted to the wildlife center as patients, if they've been hit by a car, which is unfortunately a really common cause of admission for owls, especially during the winter time, if they have suffered some, some collision trauma, almost every time there are significant injuries to their eyes because they're unprotected. They sit outside of their eye sockets a little bit more compared to other birds and other animals. So those huge eyes take up such a huge portion of their skulls and their eye sockets that they are fixed into an owl's eye sockets. That means there are no muscles attached to an owl's eyeball. We're the opposite. We do have muscles attached to our eyes. So if we wanted to look around, we could keep our heads perfectly still and we can look right, left, down, we can look all around and we don't have to move our heads a single inch. If an owl wants to look in a different direction because they can't move their eyes, they have to rotate their entire head to look that way. And you may have heard that an owl is able to rotate its head all the way around in a complete circle. That's not true, but it's pretty close. An owl is able to rotate its head about 270 degrees, that's uh, out of a 360 degree circle. So that's kind of like looking straight ahead, over your shoulder, over your back, and all the way across your opposite shoulder. Owls are able to do that thanks to specialized vertebrae in their neck. Those are the bones in an owl's neck. We have the same kind of bones, they're also called vertebrae. We have seven in our neck, we have seven vertebrae. Whereas an owl, like Gus, has 14. So twice the number of bones, twice the number of joints allow them to rotate their head almost all the way around. Owls have really, really powerful nocturnal vision thanks to specialized cells within their eyes. So just like a human eye, there are two types of cells that owls have in theirs, cones and rods. Cones are responsible for uh, interpreting color. Rods are responsible for collecting light. Humans, we don't have that many rods. We can't see at nighttime very well. On the other hand, we have lots of cones. We can see more colors than most other animals. Owls are almost the opposite. They have fewer cones, so they can see less colors, but they have about four times as many rods as the human eye does, which means that loosely an owl can see around four times better in the darkness than a human could. So those eyes are so big and so powerful, and they're so important to an owl hunting at nighttime, but that's not all. Remember, we have three big physical adaptations, eyes, ears, and feathers that make owls so powerful and such powerful hunters. So their ears, another really fascinating physical adaptation and something that's very different compared to other animals. So if you participated in Lauren's craft time event earlier this morning, you may, you may have made an owl out of an empty toilet paper tube. You probably remember Lauren said the word plumicorns about a hundred times. Plumicorns are the feathers that sometimes stick up on an owl's head. That's all they are. They're just feathers. Barred owls don't have those plumicorns. You can see it's a, it's a smooth surface on top of their heads. An owl's eyes, excuse me, ears are located just behind their eyes. One of an owl's ears is smaller in diameter, sits lower down on their head, and is situated towards the back of their skull a little bit. Their other ear is a little bit larger, higher up on their heads and toward the front, towards their face. So that different size and different placement of their ears combined with that really characteristic round owl face, that's the shape of their feathers called a facial disc. That facial disc helps to channel and funnel sound waves directly to their ears. So again, because of that different size and placement, because of that big satellite dish, they're able to pinpoint very, very precisely where a sound is coming from, even under 
a few feet of snow, even under the leaf litter in a forest floor where they might be hunting. Because owls are such successful predators, because they're so well adapted to their hunting style, a lot of owl species don't migrate during the winter time when other species may be moving away looking for better food availability, owls tend to stay in their regions year round. So gusts and barred owls in the wild here in Virginia, we consider to be year round residents. So we talked about owl eyes, owl ears, and the last physical adaptation about gusts that we'll speak on is her feathers. So those feathers are so, so important to silent flight. And that is the name of the game if you're an owl. So other birds of prey that hunt during the daytime, eagles, hawks, and falcons, they're built for speed. They're really fast flyers. So it doesn't really matter if they are sneaking up on their prey because by the time their prey sees them, it's probably already too late. Those birds are built for speed. Owls are not built for speed. They're more like stealth flyers. So their bodies are a little, little bit shorter compared to hawks and eagles and falcons. They're a little bit wider. Their wings are very much shorter, rounded on the edges, but the key to an owl's silent flight are special structures that look almost like ruffles on the tailing edge of all their flight feathers. And I pulled aside a few example feathers to show you guys. So here we have the feather of a red-tailed hawk. So I'll bring that a little closer to the camera so you can hopefully see that really fine, smooth edge. That's a really aerodynamic shape, an aerodynamic surface that helps those birds fly very quickly. Now, red-tailed hawk feather. Let's look at a great horned owl's feather. So different species than Gus, but it's a great example. So remember on that hawk feather, it was completely smooth and straight. Check out those ruffles on a great horned owl's feathers. So those structures help an owl while it's flying through the air to break up any turbulence that they might be causing as they soar and as they flap. The less turbulence that an object makes as it moves through the air, the less noise that it makes. So even though owls are a little slower compared to other raptors, it's all about stealth and silent flying as they're hunting. So I'm not sure if you guys can hear that screaming in the background of my video, but if you've kept tabs with the current patients at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, you may have read that we recently admitted two new black bear cubs. And right now I'm a, a few stones throws away from where those black bear cubs are kept and where they're housed outdoors. So I think Gus is a little curious as to what that noise is as well. So unfortunately, um, if you're watching on wildlifecenter.org, uh, I can't see your comments, but we should have our outreach educator, Lauren, alongside, watching alongside behind the keyboard. So if you have questions about Gus or owls or anything else that I've spoken about so far, I encourage everybody to submit a question, submit a comment, and we can answer for you those all in our moderated discussion. So before we sign off, again, I'd like to say thank you all so much for tuning in and celebrating Earth Day 2020 with myself, with Gus, and with the rest of the staff here online. We hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. We hope that you have a great time celebrating Earth Day 2020, and we hope that we'll see you again soon. Goodbye, everybody.